card. Give her a hand if you would. Um, speaking of isolation, there was a man here first service today who, uh, within the past, I think he said year, lost his wife and both of his parents. And he goes, it's hard for me to get out, and I'm looking for a community. And so he felt loved and accepted and welcomed here. So thank you. Because the default would be like, I don't want to deal with people. I don't want to deal with life. We need this. We need each other. Amen? So thank you. It's a great reminder. Thank you, Howard. Um, if I can invite David Kosan up, Douglas Thrasher, their families as well. We, got, we missed out on the family part of it, first service, but they're here now. So uh, now that the Kosan boys have had their cappuccinos today, right? Like, let's go. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, deacons and other ministry leaders up as well. So Davey, if you come on up. Um, uh, these are uh, our new elders official today. We, um, we, uh, we presented David and Douglas to you a few weeks ago, said take a few weeks and just dig up some dirt. Let us know why we shouldn't have them as elders. And you guys were eerily quiet, which it didn't come as a surprise to us. I think the only thing I heard was these guys love the church too much. And I go, if you're guilty of that, that can't be a bad thing. Amen. So, so grateful for these guys. I've known them for years. We've already been in the trenches ministering for years. Now they want to move into the role of elder. Some of you are like, what is an elder? It is a really old person. So let's celebrate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Gray hair. Gray hair is coming in. Uh, you think you're gray now. Give this a year and we'll see how you're doing. So. Uh, elder is a, uh, a role that God would have for men to help love the church, care for the church, protect the church, teach the church. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. Uh, we feel these men um, fit the qualifications um, for, for eldership. They've already served faithfully as deacons, and so glad to have them come alongside me and we as a team be able to, to lead the church. We believe where God wants us to lead the church. And not without the help of deacons. And deacons are men and women that want to also help us lead well. And so if the elders uh, decide on where the bus needs to go, the deacons make sure it's gassed up and the, and the radio is set with presets that are going to help us journey on this journey together. And so thankful for this team right here. And so uh, excited to have Doug, his wife Karen, David, his wife Renee, two boys, Reese and Shane here. So good to have you guys. Uh, if you would, as a church, today is the day of installation. It's a Baptist phrase, which means it's official. We're going to move forward with these guys. Why don't we stand up? Why don't we lay ha hands on them and uh, pray? Pray for this journey. Sometimes the targets on our backs as leaders is, uh, is a, great, it's a great target that the enemy would love to just try to do us, do us out. And uh, we're going to trust God to, to protect us and uh, we're inviting him to, to do that now. Father, thank you for David. Thank you for Douglas. Thank you for the, the fact that they know you, they love you. They are here for a purpose and a reason. And I know that they desire to love your church well, to lead your church well. Thank you for their hearts that have been transformed by your grace and a heart that just wants to, to serve you in return. Excited to partner with them in the, in the work of ministry. Pray that you would protect their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, protect their marriages in Christ Jesus, protect their, their families, their kids in Christ Jesus. Lord, we are, uh, we are thankful that you have made us a promise that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Thank you for a church community that loves its leaders well. Lord, I pray that the leaders would love the church well. And that we'd see amazing seasons of, of growth and maturity ahead because we want to make decisions honorable to you. So thank you for this morning, for these men. Guide our steps, direct our hearts, and help us to love and lead this church well. So thank you for the appointment of them as elders today. Be glorified in all things, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thanks, you guys. Appreciate you. Grateful for you. And I think they said they want to take every person out to lunch separately on them to get to know you. So I don't know. Is that a rumor? or? <laughs> uh, good to have you guys uh, on board. Thankful for you. Davey, are we going to run the bumper or no? Let's do it. Uh, 
Epic, epic. Davey, Davey put that all together, and he told me, he says, if I do this, we have to run it before every message for the series of Exodus. I said, all right, let's do it. Five years. You guys, I hope you guys are in for a, for a fun ride. So uh, all he, he'll even run it for you outside of Sunday morning. So that's what I heard. So uh, Exodus chapter 2. Turn your Bibles there if you would. Um, sometimes we need to be reminded that um, God is, is still present and working in our world. Sometimes we have to be removed from sometimes the trivial and the temporary and, and once again get our minds fixed on that which is eternal. Uh, this is a, a season of politics, right? Good for us. Yay. So, you know, we're going to be we're going to be just uh, doused with political news. Right. And so I'm praying that we as a church would keep our our sights higher. Uh, currently, we're we're also being doused with football news today. We've got four teams left. I'm in the, the Lions camp right now. So go go Detroit. If you want me to change my allegiance, it will come as a cost, but I'm open to do that. So um, so please let me know. But speaking of, of football, one of the teams that's going to be playing today is the Baltimore Ravens, coached by a guy named John Harbaugh. Um, he's got a brother who's going to be the coach for the Chargers. Uh, at Michigan, where uh, the other Harbaugh brother was at, uh, they had actually 70, bro- uh, 70 players baptized this last year in Christ. Uh, these are two guys that love the Lord, as made evident by John Harbaugh's po- uh, post-game conference last week, where he started the conference with this 30 with this. seconds. Um, there's something to start off with this. Um, there's something to start off with this. Um, there's something that was sent to me before the game, and it just is meaningful to me, so I'm going to share it with you, uh, because I think it's uh, uh, the right thing to do. And it's a, it's a verse. Um, Greatness, power, glory, victory, and honor belong to you. Because everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. The kingdom belongs to you, Lord. You are the head and the ruler over everything. So there's an amazing spirit on this team. And I uh, just want to kind of give honor and glory where it's due. Props to Coach Harbaugh. So now I'm kind of for the Ravens after he says that, right? So uh, let's just hope it's a Lions-Ravens Super Bowl. That would be pretty epic. But I appreciate the words on this platform, on this spot, In the spotlight, you have a coach that comes out and says, hey, before we start talking about football, let's be reminded of what's truly important. Right? Wow, we need that. We need that reset. We need that alignment, right? Props to a coach who doesn't go for the easy verses. He goes for Chronicles. That's from Chronicles. When was the last time you read Chronicles? You're like, I didn't even know Chronicles was in the Bible. But he shares a verse from Chronicles, gives glory where it's due. Ladies and gentlemen, with such a good God looking out after us, what do we have to fear? We talked about fear last week. And fear is that, that, that enemy that can creep in. And, and the, the fear, the tactics of fear that the enemy uses tries to get our, our sights off of him. Right? A Puritan several hundred years ago wrote, We fear men so much because we fear God so little. And I tell you what, that's the truth. The, the world just wants us to fear a lot of stuff. And when you're fearing all the stuff of this world on a very temporal plane, you have no time to fear the one who's truly the one we should be in awe and reverent of. And that's the God who's promised to never leave us or forsake us and to forever take care of us. It's the God I want us to celebrate. It's the God I want us to once again be fixated on. It's the God that sometimes we question, we doubt, we're discouraged by because oftentimes his plans are not our plans, right? Isaiah 55 says his ways are not our ways. ways. Sometimes his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Can anyone give an amen to that and go, it's so true. I'm trying to get God into my thinking and he wants me to get into his thinking, right? We're praying for God to deliver us out of difficulties when God says, I'm not going to deliver you out of them. My method is to deliver you through them. How many of you have prayed for God to deliver you out of something and he hasn't? Because the lessons aren't in delivering you out of something. His lessons are to deliver you through something. Because whether you're going through the fire, whether you're going through the rain, whether you're going through the flood, here's the one thing you want to know about your God is that he is with you through it all. This is the the message of Exodus. This is the message of the kingdom, the king and his kingdom that says, I am here, and I am in control, and I got you, and my plans will not be thwarted whatsoever. 
as we're going to see in this passage this morning, chapter 2 of Exodus, verses 1 through 10, you would think like, wow, how do events like this happen? How do they transpire? How do they come to be? Well, events like this transpire because there's a God who's providential over it all. Sovereignty is control. Providence is directing everything so that it accomplished is a purpose greater than anything we could ever wrap our minds around. God, throughout the scriptures, amazes his people. God, throughout the scriptures, surprises his people. As we look at Exodus chapter 2, we get to witness the, this morning the, 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 the baby Moses. We get to talk about baby Moses. I like talking about babies. We get to talk about baby Moses, and we get to talk about kind of how, how God has saved this baby from certain death to prepare him for a, a life of deliverance of his people, redemption of his people. If you have your Bibles, turn there, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. We'll read through verse 10, and we'll go back and we'll look at three uh, important people that are mentioned in this text. Um, notice we don't get anyone's name in this text. This is going to be important. So notice this. So now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful... She hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. And she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. And his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maiden to go get it. And he, she brought it to her. And when she opened it, she saw that the baby was there. And behold, the baby was crying. And she had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from among the Hebrew women so that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I shall give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Now notice, ten verses, we don't get anyone's name. We get the daughter of so-and-so. We get the son of so-and-so. We get the sister of so-and-so. Everyone is just anonymous and generic, and I'm going to tell you right now, that's the way God would have it. You want to know why? Because in the story of God's plan for the world, he's the central actor. We have a problem with fame in our lives, and what we tend to not want to focus on is not fame, but faith. We need to focus on faith, but we're too busy trying to be famous. I'm watching a comedian the other day. And uh, his name is Chris Rock, and he's got a new special on. Now, I'm just going to, this is confession time. Your pastor sometimes listens to R-rated comedy. Will you please forgive me? I sometimes jump in my wife's car. She's got XM radio. I know, on a pastor's salary, how dare they? I listen to XM radio. I go to those comedy stations. They are filthy. They are raunchy. But sometimes I laugh. Sometimes I laugh, and sometimes I listen to things I shouldn't hear, but I go, it is funny. Comedians have an amazing pulse on culture. They have an amazing pulse on humanity. I think that's why we like them so much, because they can take very difficult subjects and kind of turn them on their head and make them funny, and we kind of have to laugh, and we have to laugh at ourselves. So Chris Rock has a new special on streaming. We're watching it. Volume's down because we don't want the kids to hear what their parents are watching downstairs. And he's got a bit in his new show where he talks about the greatest addiction in our culture, in our country right now. And he says, you would think maybe I'm going to say the greatest addiction is fentanyl. And he doesn't make light of it. And he says, it's a real problem and it should be addressed. But he goes, that's not the real addiction. He says, the real addiction is this, attention. And I go, hold on, let me get my notes. He says, the problem is we're all trying to be heard 
We're all trying to be seen. We're all trying to make statements and declarations and points and positions. And with our technology, it's all about me. The focus is on self. The focus is on yelling, screaming, doing whatever we can so somebody would notice, someone would pay attention. We've got an attention problem. In the end, we're focused on fame. But none of us are focused on faith. Here's how God operates. He gets the glory. He gets the attention. Chronicles, Coach Harbaugh, his kingdom, his glory, his power. So let's just all just take a, take a, a moment and just say, it's not about us. You will no longer have your name once you meet the true King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you know when you die and get to heaven only by the grace of Jesus Christ, you are given a new name. What you thought was so important about your name is nothing if you are found in him. You are adopted in him. The greatest name you can have today is that you are son or daughter of the Most High God. There is your recognition there is your attention. No one is quibbling about, oh, I'm not named here. No, why? Because they are all submissive to a God that they want to get the glory. So, they're nameless here, but we know their names eventually. There's the good news. We know that the, in verse 1, the man from the house of Levi, his name is Amram. The, the daughter from Levi, his name is Jochebed. These are Moses' parents. We know the sister is Miriam. She's the oldest of three kids. The middle child, Aaron, a few years older than baby Moses, obviously born before the king's edict. That's why he's still alive. But then Moses is born. Pretty interesting. We have a scene here where God uses three women magnificently to spare the life of this little baby. We already met two other heroes, women of the faith, named Shipra and Pua. Here are three more. Think about it. Five women already introduced us as the greatest heroes in Exodus. <laughs> Praise God for the ladies in the house. Come on, give it up. Right here we go. Five women that would ultimately lead to Pharaoh's undoing. Five women that were used of God to do something beyond themselves. Praise God for faithful women. So we're going to meet three of them this morning. The first is this, the daughter of Levi, whose name is Jochebed, and we're going to see her consecrated heart. What do we mean by consecrated heart? We're going to talk about a heart that is set apart for God. A heart that desires holiness. A heart that desires godliness. A heart that wants to honor and glorify the King, the Lord, the Savior, the Deliverer, the, the Redeemer, right? This is, this is the heart of not only Jochebed, but her husband, Amran. We see in, in verse 1, this, this couple, we meet their parents, right? The, his parents, the, their names aren't mentioned until chapter 6, but it's Amram and Jochebed, and, and they're Levites. Notice verse 1, it says they're from the tribe of Levi. Now, one thing I love about the, the tribe of Levi is that this is the tribe that would eventually have special designation from God to provide spiritual leadership for the people of Israel. These are the priests, the clergy, the pastors of Israel. They were the only tribe not to get a portion of the land. Everyone else got a designation of land and property. The Levites didn't. They were dependent upon the people for everything that they needed for, for life and for living. But God promised them, if you're faithful in this, you're going to get a land one day that's going to blow your minds. Right? So this was a people that were set apart to make sure that the people of Israel grew spiritually People grew morally, people grew, grew uh, ethically, they had sacred tasks that they were in charge of, and they were to model living by faith, not by fear. Right? Here's a couple, and can you imagine, I mean, they're already living in a land as, as slaves, they're, they're experiencing the hardship of Egypt. And, and it's, a, it's a classic boy meets girl love story, right? He's out there slaving away, probably got his shirt off one day in that hot sun of Egypt. And she's like, who is that hottie? 
Fabio existed 3,500 years ago? Oh my gosh, I got to know him. Are you open to go get a drink? So after work, they go to this place, probably a little bar, a little, little place called the Sphinx, maybe there in Egypt, where they get a little Mai Tai together, some tapas, you know, they're getting to know each other. Oh, you're from the tribe of, oh, so am I. Like, this thing is just too good to be true. They get married, they start having babies, and then it's really dangerous to have kids, and they still choose to have kids. Can you imagine the faith of this couple? Not only getting married, not only starting a family during difficult circumstances, but now the edict from the king is now any son born to a Hebrew family is to be killed. And they choose to still sleep with one another and get pregnant. That's what happens when you sleep with somebody of the opposite sex in the context of marriage. Sometimes, like, you know, through the nookie, babies are made. And they have a baby. Why? Because they understand the command of God to have children. Now, let me just say, and I didn't say this for a service, my wife so gently reminded me between services, and this is where the second service sometimes has a leg up on the first service. We can make little changes on the fly, right? And somehow, somehow, I have yet to learn 32 years of marriage, the voice of God sounds like my wife's voice. So let me say something real quick. My wife said, commanded by God to have kids can come off a little, little bit harsh. And I said, well, I still stand by that statement, but let me dissect it a bit. We understand as a couple that sometimes couples can't have kids. But if you're able to have children, I do believe that there is a command from God for us to have kids. It goes all the way back to Genesis where he says, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Have children. Why? Because we need to send these little minions into the world in the name of Jesus so that they can be culture changers. They can be change agents. See, one of the things this consecrated heart says of Jochebed and of, of Amram is that they want their kids, while they're living in a pagan environment, to be change agents for Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, after today, you're going to see that they're on a the right trajectory. That this couple who's choosing to have kids when it's very difficult are, are daring to have kids because they understand the, the importance of releasing little Jesus people into the world, right? You ever run into somebody who's saying, I, I don't want to have kids in this environment. I don't have kids in this culture, right? It's not the right time. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're waiting for the right time to have kids, that will never happen. It's never been the right time. But with God, it's always the right time. Because here's what faith over fear tells us, is that even though you're sitting there going, how could someone bring kids into a world like this? I sit there and go, why wouldn't you want to bring kids into a world like this? You see how I, I changed? You're like, he's playing Jedi mind tricks on me. Like, I'm going to reverse your thinking because the more parents have consecrated hearts, the more it's less fear about having kids and faith that those kids will hopefully somehow be salt and light in a very dark culture. You cannot, as a Christian, live your life trying to separate yourself from the world. You are called to live as separate people while you're in this pagan and hostile environment. See, Jochebed, Amram, their neighbors may choose to immerse yourself, themselves in Egyptian culture, worship, but they're going to remain true to the one God that they know and they love in the midst of a pagan culture. See, as a parent, you become a spiritual rock star when you tell your kids God is the most important thing in our lives. He's the most important being in our lives. You know what's cool about Amram and Jochebed? Hebrews mentions them. When you're mentioned in Hebrews, I'm going to tell you right now, you're a rock star. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Notice one verse. The writer says, I need you to know about this couple. He says, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and that they were not afraid of the king's edict. So what that one verse tells you about this couple is that these were ordinary people with extraordinary faith. They were ordinary people who believed in an extraordinary God. And they were people who kept their eyes on the big prize and said, though this world will fade away, the things we do for eternity are going to last for eternity. And we're going to live with that perspective. And not only were they a power couple when it came to faith, they make beautiful babies. Look what it says in verse 2. And remember who's writing this. And Moses was a beautiful child. Okay, Moses. A little self-aggrandizement there, right? Like, I may or may not carry this picture everywhere I go. I'm just saying to you right now, we all believe in beautiful babies. You know who this is? This is El Jefe himself, Pastor Scott. 
One year of age, right there, look at that. Look at those chipmunk teeth, that really waxy comb over, and that onesie right there. Let me just tell you, I wish they made those in adult sizes. I probably have a loaded diaper because I had quite the appetite as a kid, but we're not going to talk about that right now. But notice this. I won Most Beautiful Child in California in 1971 when there was a store there called Emporium. Anyone remember Emporium? And the judge of this contest was Mr. Glenn Campbell himself. And I carry this everywhere I go because at one point I thought I'd run into Glenn Campbell and be like, remember me, Mr. Campbell? Never happened. You know, we, we celebrate baby, but we're not going to carry this. Why is Moses calling himself a baby, a beautiful baby like he's carrying around a picture of himself? All babies are beautiful. Can I get an amen? But some babies are a bit more beautiful than others. Can I get an amen? Missio makes beautiful babies. Other churches, I can't vouch for those ugly kids, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keep it up. Be fruitful. Multiply. You know what I'm saying? He calls himself a beautiful baby, but the word beautiful is actually not the word beautiful. Take out your notes. Write in your Bible this. The word is actually very good. And the writer, Moses, wants to take you back to another place where this exact word is found. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. When God is done creating everything, and he looks upon the world and he says, now this is very good. It's almost like the writer of Exodus is saying to you, God is embarking on a recreation plan that's very good. And he's going to use fallible people to accomplish this greater good. Isn't that awesome? We need to be reminded that God said the world is very good and that through this child, God is going to create this very good plan for humanity through these people in this world of Egypt. So the parents see something. They know something. God, by means of his spirit, may be prompt in their hearts to say, think, this child is going to accomplish great things. And, and I, I'm sure every parent thinks that about their kids. And every parent should position their kids for great things, for God's glory, for the world's good. Amen? But there's two things I want you to think about that help these parents really love and lead well. What, what leads to a consecrated heart? Well, I'm going to tell you two things that I think are demonstrated here. One is a teaching heart, a, t a trusting heart, and the other is a teaching heart. So they live by trusting God, and they live by teaching God. Now, the order of these is important, and I want to really be clear on this. Parents, you can never teach your kids about God until you first model your trust in God. Okay? Because if you try to teach without trusting in a word, that's called hypocrisy. Right? And when you trust God, and especially as you're trusting God through difficulties and not praying for God to deliver you out of those difficulties, you model a faith that is not necessarily academic and scholarly and classroom only. This is in the trenches, real life stuff. And your kids need to see you struggle. Your kids need to see you fight. They need to see you wrestle. They need to see that, that human element that's saying, this is not about me, this is about him. And God teaches his finest lessons when we're in the dirt, on our faces, begging for him to, be, to come through. Our kids learn more by what we're going through and how we're trusting him by anything we can sit down with them and tell them and teach them. Your kids will not learn by lecture. They will learn by living. And so here are parents that are trusting God. Amram's working long hours. We already know that Pharaoh's turned up the heat as far as the intensity, longer days. So mom, along with the daughter Miriam, have to come up with a plan Risky, innovative, yes, to, to prove that they're going to trust God for the life of their child. So we see that they're living by trusting in the fact that this woman, with her husband's input, is saying he's three months of age and he's not getting any quieter. You guys know about little babies? Like, you can handle a one to three month old little baby because their cries are like, yeah. But they hit three months. Those lungs have developed. They're like, Mah! right? It's like, you're awake in the neighborhood. Hide the kids. Put a you know, pillow over that kid's face. Stuff it with some figs. I don't know. Do something. She's realizing, I can't keep this kid quiet. There's 
uh, Egyptian patrols going throughout the community. People are looking for babies to kill. She's like, I don't want my baby to die. But she says the only course is to release this child. Think about that. A decision a parent has to make in letting go of their child. Now, some of us have to let go of our kids earlier than later. Some of us wish we can let go of our kids a little bit right now because, you know, they're, they're hobbiting up in the basement, you know, playing Fortnite till 3 a.m., you know what I'm saying? No one here, other churches, right? So we, we all as parents have a tough time realizing one day we're going to have to release our kids, but here's a parent having to release their son at three months of age. So number one, she has to come to understand, and this is where you trust God, that your God cares for your kids more than you could ever care for your kids. Can I get an amen from somebody? One of the things as a parent is you're going to have to release your kids one day. If not, they start making Netflix documentaries about your family, and that's weird. We don't want to go there. You're going to have to release your kids one day. You're going to have to trust them to a world that may or may not be kind to them. You're hoping that what they've learned under your roof is a, is a, is a one that where they can trust God. So this woman's trusting God by the fact that she's decided to release her child. But number two is how she releases him. Look at this. It says she makes a wicker basket. Write in your margins this word, and here's the actual word, ark. Only one other place in the Bible this word is mentioned, and guess where it's at? Noah! Genesis 6 through 9, Noah builds an ark. Why? Because a watery judgment is coming upon the world. And all who are in the ark will be delivered. See, it's almost like the writer is saying, as great as that ark was, and as great as the number of families were and animals were in that great ark, when that flood came, they were saved. And that ark, may I remind you, was covered with pitch and tar as well. But this woman says, I remember the account of Noah. I'm going to trust God to do the same thing through my little ark. So she creates this little ark, pitch, tar, covers it up, and she places it in the Nile. You know what I like about this? She's following the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Because Pharaoh says, throw all your babies in the water, in the Nile. She could say... In truthfulness, I did put my baby in the Nile. She just carefully placed it there. She didn't throw it, right? Even though there's sometimes we want to throw our kids in the Nile, amen? But she is smart about this. She is trusting that the God that she has come to love and adore, who she's consecrated her life for, that he loves her baby more than she could ever love her baby. So she releases the baby, but she's smart about it. So she hides him in the ark, places him among the reeds in the Nile. Now, if you know anything about water and reeds, reeds are pretty sturdy plant-like growth that comes up out of the water, and she places it so that that little ark can't go anywhere. And she places it somewhere because she knows there's some activity that takes place there. You know what takes place there? Bathing. And you know who bathes there? Pharaoh's daughter. She's got a plan. She has a smart cookie. She, with her daughter, come up with a plan. But before we get there, she's also been living by teaching God to her kids. And let me just say this because it's going to come up later. She teaches, I think, three things by, by means of her life to her children. These aren't exclusive. These aren't the only three things. But I'm going to tell you right now, these are three good things to teach your kids. So if, if you're looking for material to talk around the dinner table about, here they are. Number one, you teach the kids about the presence of God. You teach your kids about the purpose of God. And you teach the kids about the providence of God. Number one, presence. We exist in God's world. Amen? This is not your world. This is his world. You exist as a creature. He's the creator. And you're unique in creation in that you are the one, the only one in all creation that's created in his image. So right there, your life is marked with indelible worth, value. You are created in his image. And he wants you to know because you're in his world, he wants to have relationship with you. His presence means he invites you to have fellowship with him. 
He's a God who wants to love his creation. And he uniquely loves those who are created in his image by means of his son, Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? We as these relational, rational, spiritual, ethical, moral, sensitive creatures get to have relationship with God. And once you come to love him, you now get to learn from him, which is the purpose. There is no greater purpose in life than to understand what God would have you do, how he would have you live. You know what? Your household rules may be good, but if they're not God's rules, let's just go ahead and put them off the table. What matters are God's rules. Amen? And when you understand God's love, his rules are not rules. His rules are really the desire and delight of a heart that says, he loves me, why wouldn't I want to love him? See, that's when purpose becomes significant and important. When you realize you're in God's world and he's designed you to follow his will and his ways and that there's no greater joy and there's no greater delight than doing that. The Bible testifies to this. And when you're dialed into his love and you're deliberately leaning upon his lessons, you cannot help but understand that his hand is on your life. His hand is all over the things going on in this world. You have nothing to fear from the hands of men and women. You only are called to live in the fear, holy reverence and awe of this holy God. And you know what? You're good. Trust God with the rest. Amen? So these, these parents, oh, they're amazing. See, you can't teach these things until you first live out trusting God with these things. And it's by faith that they train their children, and eventually we're okay with the, to release them into the world. Can I just say one last thing, and we'll close this. Children do not flourish in an environment of fear. They flourish in an environment of faith. Can I tell you, just for us and our kids, we don't teach them life avoid, avoidance. We teach them life affection. Here's what I mean. A lot of parents like to inculcate fear in their kids. Don't do this. Stay away from that. Don't cross there. Don't look at that. Don't buy this. Don't pay attention. Don't, 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 don't. And so that kid goes out into the world and they're like, <laughs> don't step on a crack because what? Break your mama's back. Don't do it. Here's what we've taught our kids. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when you cultivate affections, life's avoidances comes as a byproduct. We don't lead with avoidance. We lead with affection. They'll learn avoidance in their own time. Amen? If I took this, did I just show you guys this? I mean, what a beautiful baby. If I took this and I turned it over, what do you guys see? It's a white blank canvas, right? But if all of a sudden I took a sharp and I put a dot Actually, there's something on there, 102. It's, it's very faint. But if I put a dot, one black dot, and I go, what do you guys see? M majority of you would say a black dot. Why we focus on that one little black speck when there's so much white to look at? Too many Christians are about the one black dot. I'm going to avoid that. I'm scared of that. I'm fearful of that. I don't want... Stop. Too many Christians are living by fear, and they're not living by faith. Stop thinking about what God doesn't want you to do, and start living in what God wants you to do. The rest will take care of itself. Amen? This is how you can develop a consecrated heart. It's person number two, the daughter of Jochebed, whose name is Miriam. This is Moses' sister. She's probably 10 to 12 years old. But she's in on the plan with her mom. And she demonstrates not, a, not, not just a consecrated heart, but a, what, a creative heart. Here's what I love about this girl. She's enterprising. She's skillful. She is thinking outside the box. She is shrewd. That's a good word, shrewd. She is one who mom and her have, reverse, have, have rehearsed this plan, right? Talk about a scene that is ripe with tension because you're thinking to yourself, mom has built an ark. She has placed the child in the Nile, in among the reeds. Now what's going to happen? Now she sends the daughter, go watch what happens. Keep your eye on your brother. 
Talk about adventures and babysitting, right? She's there. She's like, okay, what's going to happen? Now, it's no surprise because they know, as is the habit of Pharaoh's daughter, this was her favorite place to come and bathe in the Nile. And under that hot, stinky Egyptian sun, you know, these women need to take a bath, right? And she does it as a ritual for their religious uh, um, uh, affections, right? People have, have deemed rivers to be sacred all over the world, the Ganges in India, right? People go and do ceremonial things in the Ganges. All the, Egypt was no exception. Pharaoh's daughter comes down with her, 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 her maidens, which is awesome, right? Did they have tambourines? Did they have coconuts? I don't know. What are they, they walking like Egyptians? I mean, what, what's going on? They're going down into the river, and she's bathing, and she hears something. She notices something. Oh, what is that? Maiden, go get that vessel. Go get that egg. I don't know what it was. And she gets it, right? Opens it, and there's a baby crying inside. Perhaps she heard the faint cry of the baby. That's what got her attention. But all of a sudden, Miriam goes, Pharaoh's daughter, what did you find? Do you think like, she, she's just hoping like, hopefully this woman is moved not with cruelty, but with compassion. Amen? Because being Pharaoh's daughter, there was an edict within the household, kill all the Hebrew babies. She knows this is a Hebrew baby. She should have killed it per her dad's orders, but she doesn't. Why? Because her curiosity turns to compassion. And just like Miriam and Jochebed had rehearsed, if she takes that baby into her arms, make it look natural, but go up and offer someone to breastfeed the child. Hey, a little baby crying. You've got your cuddling it. And there's no one. But wait, let me go and find a mom to feed the baby. And guess who she goes and finds? Jochebed. Talk about things coming in full circle. Jochebed arrives on the scene and goes, oh, you got a baby. I just happen to be lactating. Give me that baby. All of a sudden, she is feeding her baby, reunited with her baby. Why? Because of creativity. Think about this. This would have never happened unless they had a plan. And can I tell you how important it is in our lives to not just pray for things, but to also plan for things. Praying and planning are not mutually exclusive. Even though there's some Christians who think so. Let me t tell you about this. Because there's two types of faith. There's a principle-based faith, which is shrewd. And then there's a presumption-based faith, which is stupid. Can I say that in church? Sure. Sometimes they're like, we don't encourage that kind of talk in our house. Well, it's stupid. So we're going to call it what it is because there's no other good S word, all right? At least that we can say in church on Sunday morning. Amen? Okay. So principle-based faith is shrewd, meaning this, careful planning and full-hearted faith are not mutually exclusive things. But presumptuous faith is stupid. And I'm going to illustrate for us because you cannot come to me and say, man, I am praying for a job. And I sit there and go, cool, how many resumes you have out there? And you go, none. That is presumption-based faith. Can I get an amen? You have to plan. As much as you're praying for something, you better be putting feet to your prayer and seeing something because God says, I'm not going to bless you while you're sitting in your lazy boy binge-watching something. You want a job? Get up and do something. Get up and do something. You're sitting there binge watching, you're playing video games, you're down at the Sphinx trying to meet girls. I don't know what you're doing. But all I know is this, is that God will not bless thoughtless, foolish, ignorant behavior. Right? You're sitting there going, man, I just want to be healthy as you're eating a ding dong and smoking a cigarette. I'm going, this is not good. You got your mouth full of hostess, your lung full of marble, and you're sitting there going, I just want God to bless my health. That's called stupidity. People are like, man, I really want to mature in Christ. I go, cool, I know one of the greatest ways you can mature in Christ is read the Bible. When was the last time you read the Bible? Oh, I haven't read it in three years. You know what that's called? Stupidity. All I know is Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Pray, but come up with a plan. Pray 
and trust God to work out whatever you're coming to him with because walking with faith doesn't mean you stop thinking, amen? Walking by faith doesn't mean you stop planning. Walking by faith doesn't mean you, you don't think creatively. Here's what wisdom says. Write down the word wisdom because that's shrewdness. Wisdom says do all you can do within your strength and trust God to do what you cannot do or to accomplish what you cannot accomplish. That's courageous faith, not reckless faith. Presumption-based faith is stupid because we act foolishly, we act thoughtlessly, and we expect God to bail us out when things go, go amiss, and that isn't faith at all. That's called stupidity. Again, what I know in 53 years of living on this planet, soon to be 54, I'm getting old. Look at me. I'm permanently walking around like this now. Here's what I do know. God doesn't bless bad behavior and he doesn't bless bad beliefs. Remember what Howard said earlier? Your beliefs affect your behavior and if it's bad at the core, it's going to be bad at the fruit. Change your thinking. Come up with a plan and watch God rock your world. In the end, do what God wants you to do, principle-based. Live out his will. Do what you need to do, but leave the results up to him. Because that's all God holds you accountable for, amen? Do what God wants you to do, leave the results up to him. This kind of wisdom doesn't uh, contradict faith, it complements faith. Last person we meet, Pharaoh's daughter, the daughter of Pharaoh, and we see her compassionate heart. Isn't it cool? These women, one consecrated mother, one creative daughter. Now this, this non-believer gets in the action. Can God use unbelievers to accomplish his, his purposes? Yeah. There's a proverb that says, the heart of the king is like a river in God's hands. He directs it wherever he wants. And, and can I just tell you real quick too? We as Christians need to be careful in condemning everything a non-believer does because they're not believers. Can I tell you, unbelievers can do great things in this world. Even though they may not be doing it for the right reason, can we stop and commend people for doing the right thing? Perhaps those are opportunities and entrances for gospel moments. But let's just stop and be like, well, they're not a Christian, so they can't do anything good. Let me just tell you, Democrats can do good things and Republicans can do good things. Republicans do bad things, and Democrats can do bad things. Guess what? We all stand on level ground before the cross, no matter whether you follow an ass or an elephant. Amen, church? Amen. Right. So we need to recognize the world can do good things, and the message of the Exodus is not just for Israel only. It is also for Egypt. And Egypt leaves Egypt with Israel because they're following God. They may not know him, they may not understand, but at least they're listening to the rules of Moses of how to escape. There was a mixed group in those who left Egypt. We live in a world where God is not going to remove us from, but we're called to be change agents within. So let's stop building walls and destroying bridges and find out what we can do to link arms with other people for good because it may have gospel moments later on. And all God's people said what? Amen. So here's, God's going to do something radical. Once again, throughout Scripture, when God's ready to do something radical, He often sends a baby. Which you guys are going, that's kind of weird, right? The Lord wants to accomplish a mighty work. He starts by sending a baby. Think about how true this was with Isaac. Think about how true this was with Joseph. Think about how true this was with Samuel. Think about how true this was with John the Baptist. And especially Jesus. Right? God loves to use the weakest things to defeat the mightiest of enemies. And the baby's tears were the first weapons in his war against Egypt. Think about it. The daughter of Pharaoh was moved because of a crying baby. And I'm going to tell you what an actor Moses was, because how did he know when to cry on the moment? Did God come down and give him like a little spiritual pinch and be like, all right, we need to start the waterworks now? <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's a baby crying. It takes me back to that great theological show called Phineas and Ferb. Anyone familiar with Phineas and Ferb? 
great or greatest kids show. If you do not, there, I, I'm sad to realize there's a generation that knows not Phineas and Ferb, one of the most creative shows ever written. I will tell you probably only tied up there is Yo Gabba Gabba, two of the greatest kids shows ever. That's, that, was that, that was the time I raised my kids. My kids love Yoga Yabba. They love Phineas and Ferb. But Phineas and Ferb had one episode where uh, Doofenshmirtz, if you don't know, he's the evil presence in the show, and the platypus named Perry, they would often go toe-to-toe. But Do- Doofenshmirtz was always coming up with these crazy inventions. Well, they had come up with an, he had come up with an invention of a giant mechanical baby that would cry on demand. And they did it to get Phineas's mom's attention. But the problem is when the cry of this giant mechanical baby went all over the city, all the moms heard the cry of the baby and responded and all went to go take care and console the crying baby. Because the show knows when there's a crying baby and there's a maternal heart out there, that maternal heart responds instinctually to the cry of the baby. So Schmerz releases the mechanical baby to cry. The crying goes all over the city. All of a sudden, all the moms start marching to the crying baby because they're going to fix the problem. Oh, even Disney can teach valuable lessons. Some of you are like, I'm anti-Disney. I'm offended you even mentioned that. Well, that's stupid. All right, and we'll talk later. (laughs) How's that? So Phineas and Ferb, where were we? Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's a crying baby, and Pharaoh's daughter has a maternal heart. Praise God. Her curiosity turns to compassion. And instead of following her dad's evil edict, she wants to keep the baby. Isn't this awesome. And she is holding the baby and realizes, I can't feed the baby. And there's not a maiden among my crew that can feed the baby. Miriam jumps out and says, well, hello, Pharaoh's daughter. Would you like me to go fetch a, a, a wet nurse from the Hebrew community? And Pharaoh's daughter says, go. One word that will prove the undoing of Pharaoh in Egypt. Miriam goes, Mom, guess who would love to have your presence? And Mom's going, (laughs) okay, contain your excitement, contain your excitement. Yes, Pharaoh's daughter, can I help you? I've got a baby that needs to be fed. Oh, well, let me take that baby. And you can just imagine her taking that baby into her bosom and just holding back tears. And she gets to be with her child once again. The woman who had already made a decision to release her baby. This woman who had already made a decision that I may not see my baby again. Gets to hold her baby. And just to make this deal a little bit sweeter, Pharaoh's daughter says, I'll even pay you. I get to be a mom and get paid for this? Does God not have a sense of humor? And she's going to get paid from the treasury that went to go fuel the child killing campaign, and she's going to get paid out of that to save this deliverer's life. But no amount of money in her hands can compare to the baby she gets a hold in her arms. And for probably three to four years, she gets to hold that baby and feed that baby. And if you think the nourishment was just physical, You'd be mistaken. A consecrated heart says, while I have you, I'm going to not only nourish you physically, I'm going to nourish you spiritually. And she would feed that baby, and she would tell that baby of all their ancestors and all the patriarchs and all the covenants that God had made with their people. Because one day that child would be released into Egyptian school system and learn all the ways of the Egyptians. But that child got a primary uh, education at home first. She set that child up for success. Because he would eventually be adopted into Pharaoh's home. Look at verse 10. Pharaoh's daughter says, I want to make that baby my son. Adopts him, changes his name. We don't know what it was before, but she calls him Moses. And he's given two things. He's now given a favored position. And he's given a special education. All on Pharaoh's tab. Is that awesome? Here's a baby that has been delivered in the most 
unusual of circumstances, but because of the sister's enterprising faith, because of the, the mom's endearing heart, there is now a bond between baby and mom. I love what John Piper says. He has a quote that says, in all of the setbacks of your life as a believer, God is plotting for your joy. You may see this as an interruption. You may see it as a setback. But in the end, God is going to replace all those trivialities, all those inconveniences, all those seeming like disastrous situations. He's going to say, I got your joy in mind. And so here's this mom loving and raising her child while she has a moment to do this. And yet he'll become a Hebrew and be raised with special privileges of and, and there's a couple things. One is how God loves to take the, the w- wise things of this world and turn them on their head and call them foolish. And take the foolish things o- that the world says are foolish and turn them and make them wise, right? First Corinthians chapter 1. Check this out. Write this down and look at it later. Uh, if this doesn't have to do with our passage, I don't know what does. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth, right? The world looks at you and goes, you're weak, you're stupid, your name isn't this or that. You don't have letters before your name or after your name. You haven't been educated in the best of places. You haven't been raised in white collar. You didn't grow up in this zip code, zip code or whatever. The world really knows how to make you feel horrible about yourself. And then God comes along and says, but God. Don't you love the, when the word but appears in Scripture and just says, time to think different. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Right? Look at, look at Israel in Egypt. Look at Pharaoh flexing his muscle. And yet look at these five women used of God that are going to topple him and the Egyptian government. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing to things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. One thing I know about Moses is he's going to learn not to boast. Because you realize 40 years of his life will be spent thinking he's a somebody, special privilege, special education. 40 years will be spent in isolation be reminded that he's a nobody by God. God loves to do that to us, FYI. Last 40 years, he'll learn what it means to be a nobody that can be somebody when used by God. That's the trajectory of his life in three scenes. Let me close with this. He understands the the favored position. He understands the special education. And he's going to leverage those two things to honor God and lead his people. And I'm going to tell you right now, those two things are also given to you as a child of God. Because here's Jochebed, probably walking around town. She She no longer has to hide her baby. You want to know why? He's officially been adopted into another family. You wonder about all the neighbors like, you're out in public walking your baby? Aren't you afraid he's going to be killed? Oh, no, he's no longer a slave. He's now a son. He's been adopted into a family that no one can touch. Believer, you've also been adopted into a family that no one can touch. In Christ, you've been given a favored position. In Christ, you have been given a special education. You know what that means and you know what that looks like? Once God calls you his son or his daughter, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? You have nothing to fear because perfect love casts out fear. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that who can bring a charge against God's elect? No one. Because once you're his, nothing can destroy that relationship. You know what I just threw at you? 1 John 4. Romans 8, you're his. Talk about a favored position. And God has shown you favor by adopting you into his family by means of his son, Jesus Christ. But to be reminded of your position, because I think identity is one of the greatest things that we have to battle in our lives. 
to make sure we're defined and identified by what God thinks of us, not what we think of ourselves or what our neighbors think of us. Turn off social media, please. Don't let the world tell you who you are. Go to the Word and let Him tell you who you are. You know what that special education is for you? Three things. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, the people of God. When you immerse yourself in the Word of God and trust the Spirit of God to apply what the Word of God is showing you, that Spirit is going to show you what is true and what is right and what is noble and what is excellent. And Paul says in Philippians 4, let your mind dwell on these things. For the mind set on the Spirit is life, but the mind set on the, the flesh is death. Did we not hear that verse earlier, Romans chapter 8? And when you're in a community where people are helping you, not condemning you or hurting you, but helping you discover who you are in Christ, that is a community that you want to spend the rest of your life with. We're going to focus on the Word of God. We're going to trust the Spirit of God to hopefully bring forth the people of God for His glory and our good. You see how maybe our, our, our story isn't different than what we see in the account of Exodus. God's Word is timeless. God's lessons are timeless. You're loved. You're loved, church. More than just leaders can love you, you're loved by your Lord, your God, the one who is providentially looking out for you. And all God's people said, I got nothing left. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for the beauty of accounts and scenes like this. Thank you for allowing us to spend a little bit of time with these, these women. Man, what they can teach us and what they can show us and what they can reveal even within our own lives, Lord. Thank you for using nobodies to be somebodies when used for your glory and your good. Thank you for the fact that uh, the things that Moses is going to be learning are really things that we can also be learning. Wow, you're a God who is no different then than you are today. Like we sang earlier, you're the same God. Same in faithfulness, same in sovereignty, same in providence, same in compassion, same in grace, same in mercy, same in kindness. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are our rock that we cling to. You are the anchor for our souls that we can hold on to. Thank you for your present and persevering love. Lord, we pray your will be done, not our own. We pray your glory would be known, not our own. And help us to walk as loving, obedient kids in your good grace. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you, Father, for your Son. Thank you for life and joy and hope in him. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you soon.